Welcome to your iconic image. If you want to take control of your image and be a power player in your space, then this is the show for you. Here we will arm you with tools and information to help you grow your brand on purpose. I'm your host, Marlena Semenza, photographer and visual strategist. Now let's dive into today's episode. Larry Jorgensen is a journalist and author of the Coca-Cola Trail, People and Places in the History of Coca-Cola. Welcome, Larry. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and to participate in your program. Well, thank you. You know, brands don't get much more iconic than Coca-Cola. That's true. So what was the motivation for you behind all this research and becoming an expert in this? (laughs) Well, actually, it started out not to be a book. Uh, I do a lot of freelance writing. And one of the areas I like to write about is travel. Uh, I learned that there was a Coca-Cola museum of sorts in Vicksburg, Mississippi, where Coca-Cola was first bottled, by the way. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And then I also learned that there was one not too far away in Monroe, Louisiana, which they, they kind of related. So I thought that's a great travel feature. I'll do a feature on the two Coca-Cola museums. Well, by the time I got to the second one, I had met people who were relatives, you know, heirs of the original bottlers who got talking and found out that this story is all over the country. It wasn't just in Vicksburg or in Monroe. And uh, I was encouraged to look further. Uh, And in fact, no one has really done a book about the specific area of Coca-Cola, the little bottlers, the people who got involved, you know, made it happen. Uh, Previous books are all about corporate Coca-Cola, Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I got a lot of support. The bottlers and the people that uh, found out I was doing the book were just very gracious to help and provide photos from their files and uh, exclusive interviews. It it, It was truly a great experience to do the book. And, you know, I think that's one thing that we tend to forget sometimes is that behind any brand, there's just people and the stories of people. That and very true. And, and Coke has got such a unique story of people because, you know, you say, well, you go, go buy a bottle or a can or whatever Coca-Cola. But, you know, Coca-Cola didn't think bottling their drink was a good idea. Hmm. And, and when uh, Joe Biedenhardt at Vicksburg first bottled it in 1896, um, he, he was selling the syrup. He had a, a soda fountain and he was using the syrup, which would come in gallons, you know, and make the drink at, the, at his fountain. And, and he was also selling the syrup to other, he was a distributor to other soda fountains. And he thought, you know, this is 1896 at Vicksburg. If I could get this to the people in the country so that they don't have to come to town, we could sell some more Coca-Cola. So he decided to bottle. And he sent his first two cases to Asa Candler, who at that time owned Coca-Cola and was making the syrup. And Asa responded with, "Eh, it's okay, but you know, um, I'm more interested in selling the syrup. And and Joe got a little upset because Asa never sent the bottles back. But anyhow, (laughs) um, so it goes on for five years like this. Joe Joe Bernard is bottling Coca-Cola. As it turns out, there are two enterprising, here's our new entrepreneurs in Chattanooga, Tennessee, who thought, you know, Coca-Cola is really a good drink. We get it at the local fountains. Maybe we can bottle it. So they go to Atlanta. And they talk to Mr. Candler and they say, we would like to get the exclusive rights to bottle Coca-Cola. He told them, that's ridiculous. He said, I'm worried the flavor will change. And he said, you know, and I'll quote him. He said, bottling is a backstreet business. He said, no, I don't think we want to do that. Well, the two who went to visit him happened to be lawyers and you should know it's very difficult to win an argument with a lawyer. <laughs> so they kept, they kept talking to him. And finally, he said, all right, I'll tell you what. You two go back to your hotel tonight and you draw up a little contract. Bring it in the morning. Let me take a look at it. 
So they do that. They go bounce it in the next morning with their contract. And Asa looks at it. And he says, I got to get rid of these guys. So he signs it. He signs a contract to sell the exclusive rights throughout the United States to bottle Coca-Cola, except Mississippi, because it was being done there. And he sold those rights for $1. Oh, my and and they say he never collected the dollar. And he, he told them, he said, if this doesn't work, don't come crying back to me about this, you know. So what what do these these two guys do? They go back to Chattanooga and they're like, now what do we do? We have fifteen hundred dollars between the two of us. How are we gonna bottle Coca-Cola for everybody in the United States? So they start a little bottling plant, and they, that's not the answer. Then it dawns on them. I think today we call it franchising, you know? And uh, they said, wait a minute, we've got the rights. Let's start selling little pieces of our rights. So, you know, if, if you wanted to uh, bottle Coca-Cola in uh, Raleigh, you know, uh, you could buy a 50 mile territory and uh, it would cost you X amount. And that would be your area where you could exclusively bottle Coca-Cola. Of course, you paid for the territory to these two enterprising souls in Chattanooga. And also, you were required to use the Coca-Cola syrup. That way, the flavor is the same. But the little proviso on that is when you bought the syrup, the two guys in Chattanooga got a commission on every gallon of syrup you bought. So they sold you the territory, but they were still involved in your business. And that is how Coca-Cola really took off. It was all these people all over the country. There were, I think it, it, at one point there were like 1,500 little bottlers all over. And they bought the territory. So they invested in selling your product. You know, they invested their money to sell your product. Pretty, pretty neat idea. And that's how it took off. A lot, of, a lot of experimentation and bottling by these young entrepreneurs. Um, a lot of mistakes. A lot of lessons in marketing. How do we get people to try this interesting new drink? It wasn't, you know, there were people then were bottling orange, sarsaparilla, you name it, you know, but Coca-Cola, that's kind of different. We got to get them to try it. So marketing became a big, important mission for these new bottlers as well. They learned a lot. Did they, because it was basically franchised, did they keep the marketing the same where each individual bottler had to follow certain marketing? I, I think they learned from each other. Initially, uh, it isn't like Coca-Cola, you know, today where they sit down, this is what thou shalt do. Uh, <laughs> But they, uh, they learned from each other. They always were a close group, the Coca-Cola bottlers. And uh, they shared experiences, good and bad. And they learned a lot. I think the biggest thing that all of them learned was you had to get someone to try the Coca-Cola drink because it was so different. And they would share ways that they, they did it, you know, that uh, there was a uh, Coca-Cola bottler in Santa Fe, New Mexico, that after he made his first case of Coca-Cola, took it to his favorite grocery store where he did business. And he said, I'm going to leave this case here. I'll be back in a week and I'll pick up the money. Well, he went back in a week and his case of Coca-Cola was being used as a doorstop. And he thought, hmm, that doesn't work. So he thought, I got to make people thirsty. Try my drink. So entrepreneur, he bought a big 50-pound bag of salted peanuts in the shell. He then got the youngsters in his family to put the peanuts in little bitty bags. And then he went to the high school football games and he sold peanuts. And he also took along his Coca-Cola. And he, he figured out that for every bag of peanuts he would sell, that person would come back and buy two bottles of Coca-Cola. So that's how he got people to try it. And other places, um, like I say, there were bottling, bottlers you know, doing the business. Uh, so if a, if a grocery store ordered a case of bottled soda, 
it might be four oranges and some lemon and, you know, root beer and whatever in there. Well, the bottler, if he was doing Coca-Cola, he'd slip a couple bottles of Coca-Cola in there too. Well, pretty soon it caught on. And ultimately his grocery store, his retailer was buying cases of Coca-Cola. Interesting. Do you know if the formula was basically the same back then? Or was it kind of up to whoever was doing the bottling? No, the formula has always been the same, except, and I always get asked the question, and I'm sure you're going to go to some of each to it. Was there cocaine in Coca-Cola? You know, the the urban uh, myth. Right. Coca-Cola formula is made from the cola nut and the coca leaf. And it was developed by John Pemberton to relieve pain. He's the one that invented it. And uh, he had been injured in the Civil War. You know, this is back in the mid 1800s. Because if memory serves, they used to sell Coke syrup for various ailments. You can, and, and I've talked to people who said, well, my grandmother tells me the story when she was a little kid, you know, that they would serve, like you say, the syrup was used in that manner as well. And, and you still, by the way, can buy just the syrup, but you have to get it in like 10 pound bags or something, oh my. you know, from some of the, um, I think, um, Sam's Club and places like that. So anyhow, back to the story about the cocaine as it is well the coca leaf when it was used for the coca-cola syrup was not processed the same way that when they make cocaine but consequently it had the ultimate coca-cola syrup had a slight residual that was similar to cocaine because they used the coca leaf and Asa Candler got so tired of hearing, oh, it's addictive, it's got cocaine in it, that he spent literally thousands and thousands of dollars with chemists, pharmacists, whatever, to make sure, this was in the 20s, that there would be no trace ever, could they ever find a trace of, of anything that would resemble cocaine or anything like that. So no, there is not today, and there really wasn't ever cocaine, but yes, there is the coca leaf. Interesting. And you know, it, we found today that sugar can be just as addictive. So, <laughs> right. so and a lot of them, you know, they use, uh, well, coca has come out with, as, as other brands, no sugar, you know, mm-hmm. right? And, and they've tweaked the formula to replace that sweetness. And and Coca-Cola, I mean, the flavors and the different things that they try just with Coca-Cola, not to mention their other beverages. My latest, I'm not a Coca-Cola addict, by the way, but my <laughs> latest Coca-Cola love is their new Coca-Cola coffee flavor. I don't know if you've tried it. I have not. I didn't even know it existed. <laughs> yeah, they make it in three flavors. Um Mine, I like the dark. I think there's, I know there's a vanilla and I forget what the other one is, but, and it's in those nice, long, narrow cans that everybody's using now. And it's Coca-Cola coffee. Um, My, my, my favorite trick with it is I will open one and let it get flat. And I don't drink the whole can at a time anyhow. So when it gets partially flat, the, the coffee flavor seems to come through a little bit stronger. Hmm. So I, I enjoy that and I'm not real crazy about carbonation anyhow. So Coca-Cola coffee, but you know, if you look at Coca-Cola, they're always on top of the trends, whatever, yeah. not just the Coca-Cola trends, but how many other products, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't know if you're, you're uh, aware, your viewers are aware that the milk product right now called Fair Life. Have you mm-hmm. seen it in the store? That's owned by Coca-Cola. Interesting. They bought into that company because they liked what they were doing in producing that quality milk. And mm-hmm. they got so into it that they bought the whole company. They've recently done the same thing um, 
what's the uh, Powerade? You know, the, it's mm-hmm. a competitor to Gatorade, right? Right. Well, they had a small ownership portion in Powerade. And about two, three months ago, it was announced that they bought that out. And of course, Gatorade better watch out because when Coca-Cola gets a hold of something, they start to promote it. And right. you, you may soon see on the football field, the, uh, the big containers of Powerade being poured over the coach's head. <laughs> yeah. You know, which just goes to show you that when you have a strong brand and when you've built a strong brand, you can branch off into other things. But what's interesting about Coca-Cola is that all of the other things things that they've branched out into are still beverages. Right. They have not gotten into any of, you know, cookies and candies and all that kind of stuff that, uh, that other people that make refreshments, so to speak, have gotten into. Right. Uh, and, and I think it, it's interesting to watch them because you'll see products come and go with Coca-Cola. Mm-hmm. I think a classic example um, do you remember the, the story of the, the new Coca-Cola? Yes, yes. Well, the, it's interesting as to how that happened. That was about the time that Pepsi was doing the, the Pepsi challenge. Yeah, I remember. Mm-hmm. You, you could sample two different unmarked beverages, take a sip of each one. And which one would you prefer? But Pepsi was winning that competition. It was driving Coca-Cola bonkers with that thing. So Coca-Cola, what's going on? And they determined that Pepsi was sweeter. That's why people were, you know, that's what people wanted. Well, the fact of the matter is that if you, if you sample two different drinks and one is sweeter, chances are, yeah, you're going to pick the sweeter one. But in the long haul, are you going to drink a can or a bottle of which one? And mm. it was the, the lasting flavor, the enjoyable flavor of Coca-Cola. And no, I'm not a Coca-Cola employee, but that's, <laughs> that's what people wanted. And Coca-Cola didn't realize that. I, in doing the book, I ran across stories uh, bottlers would say that their their salespeople or their the delivery men would be in the grocery store when the the new Coke was out, and little old ladies would come up and threaten them if you don't bring back my Coca Cola. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so finally, after two years of who knows how much money spent promoting the new Coca Cola, they realized it wasn't going to go, and they pulled it. You know. I think recently they brought it back for fun on a limited edition, just, you know, memories, but uh, they don't always keep everything. And, and they do, uh, you'll see occasionally, they announced uh, a couple months ago that they were pulling some brands that weren't performing. So Mm -hmm. they stay on top of it, you know? Yeah. And, you know, you talked a little bit before about the, the container for the coffee flavored one, but talk to us a little bit about the original bottle. The Coca-Cola. Oh, that's a great story. You know, back in the, uh, when Coca-Cola started getting pretty popular, well, cola was the magic, you know? So everybody's, if I say everybody, bottlers started making cola drinks. There was Coca-Cola with a K, you know, K Coca-Cola. There was churro cola. There was, I, one time I looked it up, I found over, a hundred different knockoffs, so to speak, using the term cola. Well, at that time, this we're talking the early 1900s, uh, bottles were an issue. You bottled in whatever you could find. So consequently, the consumer, when he went to the store, if the bottle said cola on it, must be Coca-Cola. And Coca-Cola said, wait a minute, we have got to deal with this. 1905, they issued a challenge to bottle manufacturers. We want our bottle. We want it exclusive. We're going to patent it. We want one of you bottlers to create the bottle. And they made a competition out of it. There were six bottle manufacturers that entered the competition. In 1905, they had a meeting of Coca-Cola bottlers in Atlanta to select the bottle. 
Well, the one they selected was made by the Root Glass Company in Terre Haute, Indiana. And if you ever go to Terre Haute, they are so proud, uh, you'll see it all over town, that they are the birthplace of the bottle. So the they, six bottlers bring their bottles to Atlanta. The bottlers select the bottle from the Root Glass Company. So Root gets the rights, the exclusive rights. They actually Root patented the bottle. And it was, uh, I think like about 20 years later, where Coca-Cola was able to buy that patent from the bottle manufacturer. Um, but the interesting thing, you've got six companies, each brought five bottles to that meeting. After the winning bottle was selected, you had to destroy the other bottles. Hmm. So they were all supposed to be destroyed. And for Coca-Cola, one of the bottles was to be kept in the archives, which it is at Coca-Cola. The rest of them were supposed to be destroyed, but one escaped. Okay, They always do, those rogue bottles. <laughs> it escaped, and two years ago, it resurfaced at an estate auction in California, and it sold for over $150,000. Wow. Yeah, we used to take bottles back for two cents, right? Yeah. <laughs> that bottle, and the reason we know it was that bottle is on the bottom of it, it had the date 1905. Coca-Cola never used that bottle in the bottling process until 1906. Hmm. So it was, in fact, a surviving prototype bottle. Wow. Uh, I, I talked to the, the, the auction company. Needless to say, they wouldn't tell me who bought the bottle. Yeah. But we know it's locked up somewhere. <laughs> That's for sure, you know. So, and you know, bottle collecting is like everything else in Coca-Cola. The people look at the Coca-Cola logo, and it's on everything. I mean, you, you know, you you name it, it's on there, and it brings back a warm memory. Mm -hmm. That logo, and people collected, there are Coca-Cola memorabilia collectors all over the world. They, the national organization meets once a year to have a national convention, and they bring all their memorabilia, and they swap and sell. But throughout the year, all the different little local state organizations will have the swap meets and you know that they'll be there swapping and selling and and it's amazing the prices they get you know if you get into that obviously there's been tons of reproductions but if you look coca-cola will authorize a reproduction but they also mandate that it has to be indicated as a reproduction. If you find a Coca-Cola trail, trail, tray, a Coca-Cola tray, and you think it's original, turn it over, look on the back and see if it's a repro. If it's not a repro, you've got something of real value. Interesting. So and when you were doing all this research, what was one of your favorite stories that you came across? I think, Overall, my favorite story was the people. Yeah. It was just the enthusiasm of the people for the product. And, and uh, to say there was one story, no, but there was a common thread. You know, when I would meet with the, the heirs of the, of the original founders and, and they would say, well, grandpa did it this way. And it was so great. And obviously there are fewer families bottling now because like every business you know maybe the fourth fifth generation says we don't want to do this anymore they're made an offer by a bigger company and consolidation takes place but the ones that we write about in the book the families that have, were there in 1900 and are still there today they have wonderful stories to tell and that that's the thing i think i found most was those stories and and they're each is unique but each has a common thread of uh love for product and desire to make it go mm. so if people want to read more about these stories how do they find your book well the simplest way is to go to the to my website which is the coca-cola trail 
don't hyphenate Coca-Cola, coca-cola-trail.com. And the book is there as is a second book called Return to the Coca-Cola Trail. The reason that book is there is after I did the first one, and thank you folks, it was popular and still is popular. I had people contact me and say, you forgot about, you forgot about, you know, in our town there is. So I started a list of forgot abouts and that led to return to. But uh, I am now done writing Coca-Cola books, but <laughs> the, the, the two you of think. them. <laughs> now, I think, yeah, although I do occasionally write, there's a, a Coca-Cola magazine that comes out once, once a month for the collectors. And if I see something of interest, I'll write a story and donate it to the magazine. But I'm on a, I'm on a different adventure now. Love it. Well, with that, Larry, I just have four final questions for you. First one was, what was the best piece of advice you were ever given? I think the best piece of advice is don't don't waste a day. Make the best of every day. You know, we don't get any do-overs. You know, in golf, what do they call that? The, uh, you, you mulligan. A, a mulligan. I was trying to think of the word. You get a mulligan in golf. You know, we don't get it. We don't get a mulligan in life. Right. So make the best. I was told, make the best of every day. You may mess up in trying to do that, but at least you've tried. So I've tried to do that. I've tried when I get up in the morning to at least have a plan. And at the end of the day, say, well, did I make it or didn't I? But at least I tried. So that I think that's good advice for anybody. To I, I agree. The, I agree. The best of the day. So share with us one thing on your bucket list. My bucket list right now consists of another book. Uh, I have really gotten addicted to this one. Um, it's uh, to describe it. It's a book about a Great Lakes shipwreck and rescue. Oh, and it is the only one of its kind of this type to ever happen. And it's almost been a secret. Uh, you know, you say Great Lakes shipwreck, of course, everybody says the Edmund Fitzgerald, which it was a, a tragedy. But this one is so unique because not only was it a shipwreck where, in fact, the crew ultimately was saved after being lost in snow. And this is in northern, northernmost Michigan, mm -hmm. where they get 300 inches of snow in the winter. Not only was the crew saved after being lost and almost freezing to death, but the cargo was rescued. Wow. And what is unique, the cargo was 1927 Chrysler automobiles. Wow. And how they got them off and how they ultimately, it was a three month project. We're talking about an area covered with snow and a, and a boat that's offshore on a reef. Wow. And that, and I had never, I've, I sometimes I vacation in Upper Michigan. This is the Keweenaw Peninsula, which is that little piece that sticks into Lake Superior. And I love the area because of the history there. Mm -hmm. And about three years ago, I was up there and I thought I knew everything about the area. And I stumble into this story about, well, the boat is called the City of Bangor. And I thought, this is an amazing story. And I started researching it and I found wonderful photos. And I started interviewing people and I thought, of all the books and everything that's been written and all the maps of Great Lakes shipwrecks, there's been 6,000 of them. This is almost a secret. The people that live up there know about it, but it is, it is really, a, and a, the neat thing is it's, it, it appeals not only to people who like to read about shipwrecks, but it appeals to old car, the vintage car collectors. Because here's this story of 220 some 1927 Chryslers that were rescued. There, mm. you know, there have been other, um, in, in those days in the 20s, 30s, when automobile was big, big time production in Detroit, there were a lot of cars delivered by boat as a cargo. Uh, and there is one 
uh, the went down in Lake Michigan with brand new Nashes on it. This was two years after mine, so it would have been 1929. And it went to the bottom and to this day, uh, the biggest Nash museum is on the bottom of Lake Michigan. Wow. There's, <laughs> there's never been, you know, I, I'm getting into it, so I, I know you want to hear about Coca-Cola, but yeah, you can see But, you it, can but this up. just goes to show you that there is so much history and so many stories all around us that we may never know. It, it is, and it, it like I say, it, it just captured me because I had never heard it before. Mm. So, so we're going to try to sh share the story. Yeah, I'd like to read that book. So when the toy companies finally get around to making an action figure of you, what two accessories will it come with? Well, I guess it would be uh, the, the, the two things it would come with would probably be a, a, a camera, you know, because I take a lot of my own pictures, although I do a lot of searching for photos in museums and libraries and family albums, and et cetera, you know. So we'd have a camera and I guess we'd have, it used to be a tape recorder. Now it's these little digital recorders, you know, which are wonderful. You know, you stick it in your pocket. I, I just recently was doing an interview um, at a, uh, relating to this book that I'm doing on the boat. And I sent this little recorder down in the middle of a, a museum, a rather large exhibit area in a museum. And we walked all over the museum exhibit area. And um, I goes back, I thought, I'll bet some of this didn't get picked up. And it was wonderful. Today's technology. So that's what it would be. You know, it would be a camera and a recorder. Love it. And one last thing, Larry, how do people find you? Well, the simplest way is, uh, you know, if, if you want to get the book, go to the website, the Coca-Cola trail.com. Um, if you want to yell at me, you know, if you have an idea, um, my uh, email address is on there, but also it's, I'll share it. It's GL, like George Little, GL management four zero at gmail.com. And I respond, you know, may not tell you what you want to hear, but I'll respond. <laughs> well, thank you, Larry. Thank you so much for being here. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, Mariana. And, uh, you know, maybe we can come back sometime with a, with a book story. Yeah, that sounds a great. Story, a story. Thank you for joining us. Once again, I'm Marlena Semenza, photographer and visual strategist. Please comment, like, or share this episode. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss a thing. For more information on how I can help you create your iconic image, visit marlenasemenza.com.